economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war. If you do not understand racism, which is white supremacy, what it is and how it works, everything else that you understand will only confuse you. Confuse you. Confuse you. Confuse you. Confuse you. If you do not understand, confuse you. If you do not understand, confuse you. If you do not understand, confuse you. Confuse you. white supremacy and racism. Uh, I use those two terms as synonyms. I use the same definition for both terms. That definition is as follows. A global system of people who classify themselves as white and are dedicated to abusing and or subjugating everyone in the known universe whom they classify as not white. Economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war. There is a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man. It is a dimension as vast as space and as timeless as infinity. It is the middle ground between light and shadow between science and superstition, and it lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his knowledge. This is the dimension of imagination. It is an area which we call the twilight zone. Well, if I understand the question, the question, I guess, is, is President Obama to blame for anything that's happening to any black person anywhere, uh, you know, that anything that's happening to a black person that shouldn't happen. Is that mm -hmm. the question, basically? Yes. Well, the answer is no. I just finished saying, the white supremacist is always to blame. President Obama is not in charge of anything, including President Obama. President Obama cannot decide his own fate. He doesn't decide anything. He asks people, just like I do, what people? The people who have the power to make things happen or keep things from happening. And they are all white supremacists. Nobody else. It's nobody else that has that kind of power. Period. None. Zero. There's no such thing as a powerful black person anywhere on this planet. Not under the system of white supremacy. Mm -hmm. That's impossible. Okay. Which and is... any black person who says, I'm powerful, put them up against the white supremacists and see about how long that lasts. Wow. Like yeah. about five seconds, I would give it. Or less. Or less. If you don't understand you don't white understand supremacy, white supremacy. What, it is, what it is, and how it works, how it works. Everything else that you understand will only confuse you. Hello, America. Hello, presidential candidates. This is Will from Boston, Massachusetts. And I hope, you know, they put this question on. It's a question in the back of everybody's head. You know, some people is further back than others collecting cobwebs. But is African Americans ever going to get reparations for slavery? I know y'all gonna run around this question dipping and dodging. So, let's see how far y'all can get. Senator Edwards, no dipping and dodging. Should African Americans get reparations? Not, not for reparations, I can answer that question, but I think there are other things we can do to create some equality that doesn't exist in this country today. Today, there was a report that right here in Charleston, African Amer Americans are paying more than their white counterparts for mortgages than any other place in America any other place in the United States of America. And here's an example. What is the conceivable explanation for this? That black people are paying more for their mortgage. And by the way, it's not just low-income African Americans. It's high-income African Americans. There's absolutely no explanation for this. It goes to the basic question that I raised just a few minutes ago. To have a president 
that's going to create, is going to fight for equality, fight for real change, big change, bold change. We're going to have to have somebody. We can't trade our insiders for their insiders. That doesn't work. What we need is somebody who will take these people on, these big banks, these mortgage companies, big insurance companies, big drug companies. That's the only way we're going to bring about change, and I will do that as president. Senator Obama, your position on reparations? I, I, I think the reparations we need uh, right here in South Carolina is investment, for example, in our schools. Uh, yeah, I, I did a... I, uh, I, I, did a, I did a town hall meeting in Florence, South Carolina, uh, in an area called the Corridor of Shame. They've got buildings uh, that students are trying to learn in that were built right after the Civil War. Uh, and uh, we've got teachers uh, who are not trained to teach the subjects they're teaching in, high uh, dropout rates. We've got to understand that there are corridors of shame all across the country. And if we make the investments and understand that those are our children, that's the kind of reparations that are really going to make a difference is, is in America anyone, right now. Is, is anyone on the stage for reparations for slavery for African Americans? In 2008, the House of Representatives formally apologized for slavery and Jim Crow. In 2009, the Senate did the same. Black people don't need another apology. We need safer neighborhoods and better schools. We need a less punitive criminal justice system. We need affordable health care. And none of these things can be achieved through reparations for slavery. You know, I, I have to confess that uh, I am less interested in apologies, which to me uh, are just words, and more interested in commitment. Uh, and as president, you know, the, the expression of grief uh, or sorrow towards our past history is to ensure that we're creating a brighter future for those who've been impacted. Uh, and that means building schools that work, putting people back to work, making sure that we've got a criminal justice system that is just. Uh, those are the steps that I think, uh, as president, I'd be much more focused on. Do you support, Do you support reparations, reparations for black people? Well, listen, 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 again, we had over 200 years of slavery. We had Jim Crow for almost a, a, a century. We had legalized discrimination, segregation, and now we have it, it, le segregation and discrimination that is not legal but still exists and is a barrier to progress. We have disparities around housing. We have disparities around education. We have disparities around income. And we have to recognize that Everybody did not start out on an equal footing in this country. And in particular, black people have not. And so we have got to recognize that and do something about that and give folks a lift up. That's why, for That's example, why I'm proposing the LIFT Act. Act. Give people who are making $100,000 or less as a family a tax credit, which will benefit and uplift 60% of black families who are in poverty. So by default, it affects black families, but there's not a particular policy for African Americans that you would explore. But no, if you look at the, the reality of who will benefit from certain policies, when you take into account that they're not starting at the, at the same place and they're not, stand, they're not starting on equal footing, it will directly benefit black children, black families, black homeowners, because the disparities are so significant. So if we focus on the specific issues that have resulted in the greatest disparities, and we understand that that's part of why we're doing it. Listen, the, the reality also is this. Any policy that will benefit black people will benefit all of society. Let's be clear about that. Let's really be clear about that. So I'm not going to so sit here and say, I'm going to do something that's only going to benefit black people. Black people. No, because no. whatever benefits that black family will benefit that community and society as a whole and the country. Right? Right? right. Fox host Charles Payne has decided that Obama is going to push for slavery reparations in 2016. Let's take a look at that video.
On Tuesday, Chicago Mayor Rahm Emanuel announced a package of reparations to victims of former Chicago police commander John Burge, who, well, these things occurred from the early 1970s to the 1990s. The $5 million is going to be spread out mostly to blacks who can prove that they were victims of his abuse. Now, the news in my mind is a glimpse of really much bigger news that's going to come from the White House. I'm saying next year I'm leaning toward, I think there's going to, A, be an official apology from the White House for slavery in America. And then there's going to be a major push to get cash, and I'm talking lots of cash. Ever since General William Sherman's special field order on January 16, 1865, of 40 acres and a mule to the blacks at Sea Island, Georgia, it has been a promise, well, it's been seen as a promise by the federal government that's never been fulfilled. Many, including those closest to President Obama, will push him to make this happen. So that's what he predicts is going to happen. What do you guys think? Any chance yeah. in hell of that happening? So if he was born in Israel, he would be saying, watch out for those Jews because they're coming after you and they're running the banks and they're trying to screw you over. Right? If that, and be, if he was, and be he was paid Jewish. very well. So whatever he is, he'll just sell out whatever he is in the most unbelievable way right there. Like, it shows a lot of character. Charles Payne has a lot of character. Yeah. Uh, he's not very good at his job, too. I love that he said it's been, it's been a promise. I mean, it's been seen as a promise. It's not actually a promise. They don't owe, you don't owe them anything. Don't worry, you don't have to give them money. And no one, of course, is going to call him on this in a year when Obama does not provide cash settlements for slavery reparations. So the issue is so ridiculous that he shouldn't have had to respond to it. But back in 2008, he was asked specifically about it, and he said he's not in favor of cash as right. a settlement for slavery. I don't know how many times slavery. he has to say this, but it's, it's ridiculous. It's not and real. I wish. I mean, there is. There's there's media matters and there's a pundit fact or, that do the actual fact checking, and occasionally they will look back at the sort of predictions, the history predictions that pundits make. But people don't care, and especially the people who watch those pundits don't care about how wrong they are, how extremely wrong they are, how frequently wrong they are. Bill Crystal still gets work. He's still advocating for war, despite the the many misstatements he had about Iraq and uh, Afghanistan. And so Charles Payne can say whatever he wants. He can get he can sell out his community and get huge paychecks as much as he wants, and no one is going to come back in a year and actually point out how ridiculous of a prediction it was. Yeah, there will be no penalty for not being right about anything. Yeah. There never is. In fact, they fail upward. It seems like the more wrong they are, the more they get promoted. Yeah. But look at all the people who crashed our economy on Wall Street, and they certainly paid a price. Yeah. <laughs> so I love that he says that, uh, so on the Tea Party News Network, uh, Scott Nell Neil Hughes, a frequent Making Money guest, he said that, sure, slavery was a horrible thing that happened, but this is not going to help race relations in the United States. Yeah. But you no, know it's what, actually, Will? It's, it's a very young, attractive Well, I know he woman. really cares you know, about that, too. Oh, you know it what? Is actually. Scotty is yes. her name. Scotty. Yeah. So yes. you know what will help race relations? Charles Payne trying to get dumb, mouth-breathing white people angry at blacks for something that's not happening. <laughs> yes, that will help. <laughs> that will help us. Yeah. yeah. I love starting a sentence, by the way. Let me let me take your, your copy of this. I love starting a sentence with, sure, slavery was a horrible thing. <laughs> I don't care what the end of the sentence yeah. is. You fucked up. If you don't understand, you don't understand white, supremacy, white supremacy, what it is, what it is and how it, and works, how it works, works, everything, everything else, that else that you understand, you understand will only confuse you. No one, of course, is going to call him on this in a year when Obama does not provide cash settlements for slavery reparations. So the issue is so ridiculous that he shouldn't have had to respond to it. But back in 2008, he was asked specifically about it, and he said he's not in favor of cash as a settlement for, for I don't know how many times he has to say this, but it's, it's ridiculous. It's not real. And, it's Morning Edition from NPR News. Good morning, I'm Steve Inskeep. Most of the stimulus money flowing from Washington is intended to create jobs or preserve them. But some of the money, $198 million to be precise, will be used to pay an old debt. It goes to Filipino veterans of World War II. They helped the United States defeat Japan in the Pacific. The Filipino fighters never got the money that America promised them. As NPR's Richard Gonzalez reports, some of them clearly need it now. The men who can tell stories of fighting hand-to-hand -hand against the Japanese in the jungles of their native Philippines can still be found in run-down and dilapidated single-occupancy hotel rooms. They are men like 85-year-old Faustino Abago. His room in a San Francisco tenement carries a strong odor of mold and mildew. Many of Abago's teeth are missing, and he struggles to tell his story. It's very hard to explain. That is, until he opens his shirt and points to a massive scar covering most of his chest. 
Chef Neil of the Hen Grange of the uh, Japanese Army. So that was shrapnel from a Japanese grenade? Japanese Army. That I am claiming my pension. This, says Abago, is why I'm claiming my pension. Abago is one of more than 200,000 Filipinos who, during World War II, pledged loyalty to the United States. They were made U.S. citizens and promised veterans benefits for fighting alongside American soldiers. But in 1946, President Harry Truman signed a law stripping the Filipinos of their citizenship and reversing the promise of benefits. Over the years, they pressed their claims, and some regained their citizenship. Finally, this year, in President Obama's economic stimulus package, there's money for the old Filipino fighters. $15,000 for U.S. citizens, 9000 for non-citizens. I will just have to say thank you for those who ever passed the bill. Pedro Tabor is one of the Filipino vets and a member of the American Legion. He's at a party to celebrate the news. Because we had been expecting this for more than 62 years until now. I hope it will really come. But the one-time payment is in lieu of a monthly pension and survivor's benefits. It also releases the government from any future claims. It's all getting mixed reviews in the Filipino-American community. Well, I call it bittersweet of victory. <laughs> Lourdes Tansinko, an attorney who represents the veterans, says she's happy because in an ailing economy, $198 million is real money, and it will help the surviving veterans. But at the same time, I feel bitter also because I think of the veterans who just passed away last week or during the last years that I, we've been here. They've been hoping for this to happen, to be recognized, but there's nothing, nothing in the stimulus package that would benefit them. There is some criticism that compensation, even if justified, has no place in a bill designed to create jobs. But to the Filipino vets, it represents long overdue recognition. You still remember how to march, right? In San Francisco last week, about two dozen of the old veterans lined up behind an ROTC color guard. They gather each year to remember the day Truman stripped them of their benefits. But this year, it was more of a celebration. The old men, all in their 80s and 90s, struggled to keep up, but they kept marching. Well, this is a victory for them because it's a very historic occasion. Rudy Assertion is a member of the American Legion and longtime veteran supporter. Because after 63 years of fighting for their honor and their dignity to be restored, finally President Obama signed a law that restored their honor and dignity. Assertion says the money probably isn't enough. But then he asks, how do you compensate a soldier who gave the best years of his life? Richard Gonzalez, NPR News, San Francisco. No one, of course, is going to call him on this in a year when Obama does not provide cash settlements for slavery reparations. So the issue is so ridiculous that he shouldn't have had to respond to it. But back in 2008, he was asked specifically about it, and he said he's not in favor of cash as a settlement for, for I don't know how many times slavery. he has to say this, but it's, it's ridiculous. It's and, and, from NPR News, this is All Things Considered. I'm Michelle Norris. And I'm Robert Siegel. At long last, a settlement has been reached. Those are the words from President Obama's statement on a major settlement announced today. More than a decade ago, American Indians sued the federal government, saying that they'd been cheated out of billions of dollars. Today, the government said it will pay $3.4 billion to resolve that lawsuit. In a moment, we'll hear from the lead plaintiff, Eloise Cobell. But first, NPR's Ari Shapiro lays out the settlement. There are epic lawsuits, and then there's this case. Cobell versus Salazar was one of the largest class actions ever brought against the United States government. Attorney General Eric Holder. What began in 1996 has seen seven full trials constituting 192 trial days, has resulted in 22 published judicial decisions, has been up to the Court of Appeals 10 times, and has been the subject of intense and sometimes difficult litigation. But Holder said, today we turn the page. Eloise Cobell was the lead plaintiff in the suit. She said she expected to have a resolution 10 years ago. Today we have an administration that is listening to us an administration willing to admit the wrongdoings of the past and settle this matter to benefit those who had to do without access to their own money for way too long. The problem started in 1887. 
That's when Congress passed a law called the Dawes Act, allocating parcels of reservation land across the country to individual Native Americans. The government would use the land for timber, mining, oil, and other purposes, and then they were supposed to distribute the profits to the Indian landowners. But over the years, the Indians did not get the money. So now the government says it will divide $1.4 billion among the plaintiffs, about $1,000 per person. Eloise Cobell said the settlement is far less than the Native Americans are entitled to, but she and her fellow plaintiffs felt they had to settle now. Elders are dying, she said, and many account holders live in the direst poverty. And the settlement can begin to address that extreme situation and provide some hope and a better quality of life for their remaining years. Over the decades, the land that the government allocated to Indians was divided into smaller and smaller parcels as it was handed down through the generations. Many parcels are so small that they generate less than a dollar a year, but it costs the government a lot of money to administer the program. So under this settlement, the government will spend $2 billion to buy back land from individual owners who are willing to sell. Interior Secretary Ken Salazar said he's optimistic that people will participate because there is an incentive. As people sell back their land, money will go into a higher education scholarship fund. Native Americans very much uh, believe that a uh, keystone to their future is uh, opportunity that comes through education for their children. But this is not final yet. Congress and the courts still have to sign off on the agreement. Secretary Salazar, who used to be a senator from Colorado, said he was on Capitol Hill this morning lobbying his former colleagues. Our hope is we get it done by the end of the year, now in December, this month, uh, at least in terms of the legislative approval. In a statement, President Obama said, As a candidate, I heard from many in Indian country that the Cobell suit remained a stain on the nation-to-nation -nation relationship I value so much. Mr. Obama urged Congress to act quickly to sign off on the settlement. The court approval may take longer, but no one expects it to be a major obstacle. In fact, one person involved in the negotiations said the single person most responsible for the resolution of this lawsuit was the judge, James Robertson. The source said Judge Robertson brought both sides into his chambers over the summer and said, you can litigate this for another 10 years or you can resolve it now. I want you to resolve it. Ari Shapiro, NPR News, Washington. What it is and how it works. From NPR News, this is All Things Considered. I'm Melissa Block. And I'm Audie Cornish. This month, the nation marks the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington, where Dr. King spoke of his dream for a more equal America. And 25 years ago, the Japanese-American community celebrated a milestone in its own campaign for civil rights. On August 10, 1988, President Ronald Reagan signed a bill compensating Japanese-Americans for being sent to internment camps during World War II. No payment can make up for those lost years. So what is most important in this bill has less to do with property than with honor. For here, we admit a wrong. Here, we reaffirm our commitment as a nation to equal justice under the law. Two documents that tell the story of the campaign for reparation recently went on display at the National Archives here in Washington. NPR's Bilal Qureshi reports. We are setting a standard for the rest of the world in the treatment of people who may have loyalties to an enemy nation. We are protecting ourselves without violating the principles of Christian decency. In 1942, the U.S. War Relocation Authority moved more than 100,000 people of Japanese descent behind barbed wires. They were forced to abandon their homes and businesses. Most of them were citizens, and many of them were children. John Tateishi was one of them. He says it was humiliating and disorienting. We came out of these camps with a sense of shame and guilt and of having been considered betrayers of our country. And he says after the war, most families never spoke about it. There were no complaints, no big rallies or demands for justice because it was not the Japanese way. But decades later, a new generation wanted to challenge the Japanese way. In 1978, the Japanese American Citizens League launched a campaign for redress. Two years later, Congress responded by establishing a commission to investigate the legacy of the camps. These meetings were held around the country, and it was unbelievable what came out of that. Um, the emotion that was probably suppressed for a very long time. Congresswoman Doris Matsui says that emotional testimony empowered the movement. And when the commission issued its final report, it called the incarceration a grave injustice, motivated by racial prejudice, war hysteria, and the failure of political leadership. 
The bill that emerged from that report provided a written apology and $20,000 in tax-free compensation for each victim. It was co-sponsored by Norm Mineta. He served in two presidential cabinets, but says that bipartisan effort for redress remains one of his proudest achievements. Today, uh, I just feel that Congress is so polarized that I'm not sure that a grassroots movement like this would have the kind of impact that we see resulting in the signing of the bill by President Reagan in 1988. Thank you all again, and God bless you all. I think this is a fine day. Back at the National Archives, I found 24-year-old Lauren Namba quietly looking at that bill in its glass case. Seeing the Civil Liberties Act of 1988, which basically granted redress to all of those who survived the experience, it was very... It was very moving. Has been given its day in court. The Jews got their day in court. Japanese got their day in court. Koreans got their day in court. Everybody got their day in court and everybody got the opportunity to compel the defendants to come forward and account for what they did. The only group that remains is Africans or if we were to pay reparations today, we would only divide the country further, making it harder to build the political coalitions required to solve the problems facing black people today. We would insult many black Americans by putting a price on the suffering of their ancestors. And we would turn the relationship between black Americans and white Americans from a coalition into a transaction, from a union between citizens into a lawsuit between plaintiffs and defendants. What we should do is pay reparations to black Americans who actually grew up under Jim Crow and were directly harmed by second-class citizenship, people like my grandparents. What it is and how it works. It's a slam dunk, unless, unless somebody decides that it is a political issue and that blacks aren't entitled to, to, these, to make these claims. But every genocide claim that has been made in this courthouse has, has been upheld and allowed to go to trial. Everything else that you understand will only confuse you. So reparations for slavery would allocate federal resources to me, but not to an American with the wrong ancestry even if that person is living paycheck to paycheck and working multiple jobs to support a family. You might call that justice. I call it justice for the dead at the price of justice for the living. I understand that reparations are about what people are owed, regardless of how well they're doing. I understand that. But the people who are owed for slavery are no longer here, and we're not entitled to collect on their debts Reparations, by definition, are only given to victims. So the moment you give me reparations, you've made me into a victim without my consent. Not just that, you've made one third of black Americans who poll against reparations into victims without their consent. And black Americans have fought too long for the right to define themselves to be spoken for in such a condescending manner. The question is not what America owes me by virtue of my ancestry. The question is what all Americans owe each other by, by virtue of being citizens of the same nation. And the obligation of citizenship is not transactional. It's not contingent on ancestry. It never expires and it can't be paid off. For all these reasons, Bill H.R. 40 is a moral and political mistake. Thank you. I like to think that I'm a relatively aware and conscientious individual. I kind of have to be trying to do what I do. <clears throat> but I read, I've read a couple of your highly illuminating, informative books. This one here is Black Labor, White Wealth, The Search for Power and Economic Justice. And you have an appendix in this book that sort of blew my mind. 
uh, as I was reading down it. And that was, it's titled Boundary Safeguards and Restrictions in Southern States. And you, you mentioned many things like in 1619, the Maryland segregation policy, which we're right here on the doorstep of Maryland, recommended that blacks be socially included and so many other things uh, in, in this particular appendix here. But when I got down to the year 1775, there was something called the Virginia Runaway Law that allowed the sale or execution of slaves attempting to flee slavery. And I thought that I would bring this up in this discussion because oftentimes there are people who say, oh my God, why are you still talking about slavery? And I think that in 2015, there is for the most part, a wholesale lack of appreciation for the impact that slavery for the hundreds of years that it was practiced has on today's world. Right, and see, black folk are still under the impact of, of 360 years of slavery and another 100 years of uh, Jim Crow semi -slavery. I didn't hear the first part you said. That they're still being burdened, they're overburdened by slavery because no one has addressed the negative impact of slavery on black folk, never been addressed. Because what was the purpose of slavery? The purpose of slavery was to systematically, socially engineer black folk into the lowest level of a real life monopoly game that was based on wealth, <clears throat> power, and control, what you own and control. And slavery itself then maldistributed almost 100% of all this nation's wealth, power, resource, privileges, and controls of all levels of government into the hands of the dominant white society. And black folk, don't have, they don't have enough resources to be, able to, com to be a competitive group. When black folk came out of slavery, let's say before they even went into slavery, uh, they owned and controlled nothing. When they came out in the 1860s, a few blacks, about 250,000 black folk, had successfully acquired one half of 1% of this nation's wealth. And that was in 1860, Rock. Here you are 150 years later, black folk still own and control one half of 1% of this nation's wealth. And it's wealth that controls what you get, what your opportunity is going to be. And uh, that, w that one half of 1%, what does it equate to today? That means that, that means that the typical white person right now has 3,500 times more wealth than black folk. And when you tell black folk to go out and compete, compete with what? What are they going to compete with? They don't own and control anything. They only still only control one half of 1% one of anything that is that, uh, value in our society. While they are being burdened down with six to seven times of their fair share of everything that's negative. That all the social pathology is being inflicted on them. They are the ones that are bearing the burdens of low-income housing, poverty, food stamps, welfare, dysfunctional families, no businesses, no opportunities, failing school systems. They are the ones that are being negatively impacted. Nobody has ever addressed the real issues. The civil rights movement didn't address the issues. They started talking about social integration. The social integration was not the problem with black folk and the, even the concept of civil rights. They twisted and corrupted that concept. Civil rights was initially talking about what you're going to do for black folk in the country when it came out in 1865 and 1866 in this first civil rights laws. <clears throat> and what those civil rights laws were trying to address was correct the Dred Scott decision of 1857. And what I, what I mean by that, that black folk had no rights and they could own and control nothing. And so when you had, and here in Washington, D.C., you had some congressmen called radical Republicans like uh, Congressman Benjamin Thaddeus and Charles something and the rest of them, they said this that the only things that black people can ever be in America, they're either going to be free or they're going to be slaves. Minimally, to be free, they must have 40 acres, a mule, and $100. Now, immediately, uh, Andrew Johnson, who replaced uh, Lincoln when he got assassinated, he vetoed it. Yeah. And, and, and after he vetoed it, when the conservatives took over uh, uh, the, uh, the control of black folk, the northerners walked away from it, left them, abandoned them. They, black folk were forced into Jim Crow segregation and peonage. And they corrupted the whole concept of civil rights and made it a, made it a, civil, a issue civil issue for everybody. everybody. Nobody's, Nobody's ever enslaved ever the gays, gays, the midgets, the humpbacks, the humpbacks women, women uh, 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 Asians, Asians, Arabs, Arabs Hispanic, Hispanic and American Indians. They, they enslaved black folk. folk. That's, why, That's it's why it's critically important, important, go back to one of your earlier questions, questions for people to understand. understand. When you start talking about issues, about rights, the Dred Scott decision said, the black man has no rights. It didn't say the Asian man, the Arab man, the Mexican man, the Indian man. It says the black man. So how, what's happened now is that the whole concept of civil rights and social integration, all this has been mal distributed and it's been corrupted into what we call fabricated classes. They're getting all the benefits that black folks should be getting today. 
all these, and it's intentionally and being designed to make sure everything is moved away from black folk and the lock and the, the box stays on black folks so they never get out, never get out. <laughs> not a test. This is your emergency broadcast system announcing the commencement of the annual purge sanctioned by the U.S. government. Weapons of class 4 and lower have been authorized for use during the purge. All other weapons are restricted. Government officials of ranking 10 have been granted immunity from the purge and shall not be harmed. Commencing at the siren, any and all crime, including murder, will be legal for 12 continuous hours. Police, fire, and emergency medical services will be unavailable until tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. when the purge concludes. Blessed be our new founding fathers and America, a nation reborn. May God be with you all. Concentration camps. People mostly associate the term with Nazi Germany, but historians say it's true. They also existed in America. During the Civil War, authorities in Natchez, Mississippi, forced tens of thousands of freed slaves into camps built in what's known as the Devil's Punch Bowl. Jacob Kittlestadt explores this forgotten history this Mystery Monday. Untouched fruit falls to the ground near the banks of the Mississippi River. They talk about there's the most beautiful wild peach groves uh, down in the punch bowl. And researcher Paula Westbrook says, like a peach, the area known as the Devil's Punch Bowl has a pit, a mass grave from the 1860s. Historians estimate that in one year, up to 20,000 freed slaves died in contraband camps below these bluffs. When the slaves were released from the plantations during the occupation, they overran Natchez. And the population went from about 10,000 to 120,000 overnight. So they decided to build an encampment for them at Devil's Punch Bowl, which they walled off and wouldn't let them out. Don Estes is the former director of the Natchez City Cemetery. I just put my own tombstone right there. You see Estes? Learning history's been his life. He says Union troops ordered recaptured black men to perform hard labor. Straight down, right here. While women and children were all but left to die in the three punch bowl prisons. Disease broke out among them, smallpox being the main one and thousands and thousands died. They were begging to get out, turn me loose, and I'll go home back to the plantation, anywhere but there. But they wouldn't let them out. The Union Army did not allow them to remove the bodies from the camp. They just gave them shovels and said, bury them where they drop. And I'd really like to show you more of this terrain, but it's just too thick with greenery. These bluffs are also straight down, so not only is it dangerous to navigate, it's still very mysterious back there. It's a bed of alligators and snakes. Uh, it would take Indiana Jones to get back in there at this point. And then you come on up washing away bluffs and it, the devil's punch bowl that has so many people that no one knows how they got killed or when, and they're still down there wasted and even to this day they talk about wild peach trees that come up down there but no one in natchez will eat them because they know what the fertilizer was exploring the unexplained on mystery monday jacob kittlestead wjtv news channel 12. and historians say even now people might discover old skeletal remains after flooding on the mississippi but being on the natchez trace sometimes it's difficult to tell which century those bones are from Every victim group in the world but one has been given its day in court. The Jews got their day in court. Japanese got their day in court. Koreans got their day in court. Everybody got their day in court and everybody got the opportunity to compel the defendants to come forward and account for what they did. The only group that remains is Africans. Or African what it is and how it works. 
at the very same time that America refused to give the Negro any land, through an act of Congress, our government was giving away millions of acres of land in the West and the Midwest, which meant that it was willing to undergird its white peasants from Europe with an economic floor. But not only did they give the land, they built land-grant colleges with government money to teach them how to farm. Not only that, they provided county agents to further their expertise in farming. Not only that, they provided low interest rates in order that they could mechanize their farms. Not only that, today many of these people are receiving millions of dollars in federal subsidies not to farm, and they are the very people telling the black man that he ought to lift himself by his own bootstraps. And this is what we are faced with, and this is a reality. Now, when we come to Washington in this campaign, we are coming to get our check. You are now listening to P.A.R., People Activity Radio, and I'm your host, John G. Horse. Welcome. You have found your family in a peaceful place. PAR aims to be a family friendly information distribution program seeking to inform non white people, in particular black classifieds, and assist them in counter racist codification. The title of the day's show is Reparations Black Scapegoats, Benign Neglect, and Beyond. Reparations, black scapegoats, benign neglect, and beyond. Yes, I'm going to address one of the hot topics of mainstream news. Reparations. As you just heard in the series of clips that I played prior to me speaking. That reparation is not a confusing term. Corrective action is not anything foreign to the federal government of the United States of America. As you heard in the clip that I played before, as it pertains to the United States politics and people who are classified as black, Reparations becomes this, how should I say this without being uh, mis- m- without giving inf- mis- m- without giving misinformation, excuse me, I got tongue tied. Reparation seems to be this taboo subject when it comes to the political realm of the United States of America as it pertains to people classified as black, as you heard. I played Senator Barack Obama's position on reparations purposely. And I quote, Senator Barack Obama was not for reparations. Senator Barack Obama was adamantly against reparations from his own words but I played that in sequence with the reparations hearings young man by the name of Coleman Hughes and when you heard Barack Obama say well I'm not for reparations but I am for criminal justice reform I am for reform in housing i am for etc etc but he wasn't for anything specifically for black folks in the form of corrective action and or reparations the young fella in the hearing who got booed by a lot of black folk at the hearings said the same doggone thing coleman hughes said i do not agree with reparations and matter of fact i have a problem with being made a victim without my consent. I don't want no apologies. 
enough of that. Let's make affordable health care. Let's reform the criminal justice institution, et cetera, et cetera. Verbatim, the same thing that former president, but then Senator Barack Obama said. Not only that, I played Democratic presidential candidate Kamala Harris's response to no, I'm not for reparations, but I am for criminal justice reform. I am for affordable health care. Yada, yada, yada. And then she went the logical step and said, look, by no means that I'm going to do something specifically just for black folk. That would be called corrective action and reparations for people who've been classified as black. Hell no. She said the same thing that then Senator Barack Obama said and then President Barack Barack Obama doubled down on. She She said the same thing that the young fella by the name of Coleman Hughes said and he got booed in the reparations hearings. She's saying the same thing that the system of racism, white supremacy, the federal government of the United States have been saying for the last 400 to 500 years. You a loser, you a designated loser, walk it off, Negroes. But these people who are classified as non-white in particular, black classified, President, former President Barack Obama, uh, the young fella that spoke in the uh, reparations hearings, Coleman Hughes, presidential, Democratic presidential candidate, Kamala Harris. They become the scapegoats for a system that preceded their existence. Not going to work. Don't make no sense for us to waste energy and time talking about fellow victims responding to their victim status the best way that they figured they could for their interests do you understand me because when it came to the Filipino World War II veterans President Barack Obama divvied out 198 million when it came to corrective action for the Native Americans, President Barack Obama divvied out 1.4 billion. When it came to the survivors of the Japanese internment camps in the United States of America, President Ronald Reagan cut the check, 20,000 for each surviving victim. You understand me? But when it comes to people who are classified as black, everybody's patting their pockets and acting confused. The people who are most confused to what is old, that's not people who classify themselves as white and believe in white supremacy and are in power positions. They clearly know what is old. You understand me? They clearly know the non-just track record that targeted and still targets people who classified as black today. Matter of fact, the UN, the United Nations has said, put out a report that the United States of America owes people who are classified as black corrective action specifically for black people. The government of China has put out a report that people who are classified as black in the United States of America are long overdue for corrective action and reparations specifically for people who are classified as black well today there is a contingency in the black community that are saying you know what 
we are old we have earned we don't want to be lumped in with other groups of people who are classified as non-white and or minority that ain't working for us matter of fact if we continue to support that strategy we won't survive in the united states of america you understand me and here on people activity radio we agree with that position Coleman Hughes said he wanted to be a he didn't want to be a victim without his consent. Young fella, go and get your weight up. You know, uh, when I was his age, I was extremely confused. So I'ma chalk that up to youthfulness. And we're gonna keep it moving on young fella Coleman Hughes. But he is a case study of what happens to your young when you allow them to be educated by people who do not have your best interest. Integration failed. He is an example of whatever so-called integration was. It failed people who are classified as black. If you don't understand what I'm saying, research Coleman Hughes' comments on reparations. Talking about he don't want to be a victim without his consent. Victimhood is without your consent, young fella. Then you had the white lawyer stating some facts about people who are classified as black has never been given justice in any court as it pertains to slavery. Everybody else, he said, has been given justice except African Americans or Africans, as he said. Negroes, colored. Whatever you want to be called. If you're classified as black, you fall into that category in the United States of America. And you are descendants of American slaves. Then you had Dr. Claude Anderson dropping logic on the hustle of minorities. Meaning everybody's a minority and everybody receives benefits and tangibles based on minority status, white women, handicapped white people, white homosexuals, uh, immigrants. But when it comes to people who are classified as black and the descendants of American slaves, we are the last to receive anything if anything is handed in our direction. And we are shamed for requiring corrective action I also played a clip about contraband camps these were the camps that were involuntarily formed by union troops because during the north and south civil war people who found themselves on border border states fled to the north for refuge and in some cases they were killed by northern union troops other cases there were opportunistic uh, northern union troop leaderships who said you know we can, we can use these folks let's let's uh classify them as contraband meaning contraband of war and we can use this for our within our war efforts so they would use black men women and children for harsh labor among other things and in a particular case in Mississippi in Natchez Mississippi there was a recording recorded incident where the Union troops the Northern troops they just starved the Negroes to death in the contraband camp and or concentration camp. They would not provide them with water. They would not provide them with food. They would not provide them with medical care. They would allow them to die off and easily cured diseases. And where they dropped, they would throw them shovels and say, bury them where they lay. 
you understand me. Not only victims of slavery, victims of genocide, Jim Crow, peonage, mass incarceration, redlining, housing discrimination. You could go on and on. And then we're told to compete. Pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. I concluded with Martin Luther King's famous speech about going to the White House to collect our check. You understand me? Very powerful speech. He's just speaking historical fact within that speech about all the handouts and free tangibles that people who are classified as white receive. And at the same time, people who are classified as black were not allowed to receive based on their black classification. And then we're being told to pull ourselves by our own bootstraps by the people who got a whole bunch of free handouts from the federal government. Oh, they are classified in white, classified as white, and they believe in white supremacy. There ain't nobody gonna come and save us. Gotta understand that. Whatever corrective action we receive, it's gonna be because we went and got it. Just like we went and got our freedom. Just like we went and got off those plantations. Just like we went and got out of bondage. Ain't nobody give us nothing. We forced the federal government's hand. Say, if y'all want to win this war, put a musket in our hand. This thing going to be over overnight. And they promised us 40 acres in a mule and full citizenship after victory. And they reneged on our ancestors and vetoed their promise. Same old story, same old game, same old people who classify themselves as white and believe in a system of racism, and white supremacy. Tangibles 2020. Reparations 2020. Reparations is the only thing, corrective action is the only thing that we need to be concerned about. Stop falling for the trick of blaming other black folks. Those are scapegoats, man. Start focusing on the, on the usual suspects, people who are classified as white, who classify themselves as white and believe in white supremacy. They yield all the power. I'm gonna let Dr. Michael Eric Dyson and nearly fuller, Junior, take us on home. Cue to clear. Cue to clear. The misery growing up in the same way. He doesn't have the same anger necessarily that black people have. Uh, that 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 we are outraged by this stuff. He didn't feel it in his gut the same way. I'm not saying he ain't black. He's blacker than black. I've known Obama since '92. One of the blackest dudes I know. But what I'm saying is that your being black ain't got nothing to do with the kind of blackness and the kind of experience that you that you had and endured. And so you don't you don't feel driven to speak out. You don't you're not LeBron James who said I'm going to represent for my neighborhood where I came from regardless of all the cash I got. And it's time to put the fire under Obama too. You out of office now. All the negro excuses made for you while you were in office to 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 to, for us to say, wait till the second term, he gonna do something. Wait till the last half of the second term, he gonna do something. What'd he do? And I'm saying, finally got on the criminal justice reform. Okay, and I'm saying this out of a love for Obama. I know there's some Negro bots out there. There's some Obama bots who can't hear nothing. They just as bad, let me tell you what, Obama bots are just as bad as these Trump supporters who can't hear criticism. Mm -hmm. If it's your guy, be willing to say, you know what, I love him, I'm gonna ride with him, ride or die, but there's some stuff he could have done better.
Michael Eric Dyson, great professor, but dang, some stuff he should have done. Let's challenge him. Let's force him to be more considerate and literate and understanding of X, Y, and Z. That's the nature of the job. So don't be mad at me for saying that. The problem is I'm tired of making excuses for Kanye and Obama. Speak up. Use your bully pulpit. You call Kanye a jackass, where you at? Where are you on Trump? Where are you on the vicious bigotry that pervades this country? Where are you now besides making capital and cash and accumulating commerce? Where are you? Speak up, sir. That's the challenge we have for you. I have some information right in front of me now that I got from the Washington Post newspaper. This is the leading newspaper in the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, and it's dated Tuesday, which was yesterday, February the 27th, 2018, page A3. And it's under Politics and the Nation. There, yeah, that's the uh, headline on it. And it says, Economic Inequality Gap for African Americans uh, endures. So this report finds. Now they have made a recent report that was based on the report that you're talking about, the Kerner Commission report that came, that was published in the 1960s. Yes. Right after the riots. Yes. Now, what does it say today on page A3, which was yesterday, Tuesday, February the 27th, 2018? It says here, and I'm looking at it, no progress in 50 years of home ownership and unemployment rates. Talking about black people. That's what it says here. 50 years after the historic Kerner Commission identified white racism as the key cause of pervasive discrimination in employment, education, and housing, there has been no progress in how African Americans fare in comparison to whites when it comes to what? Home ownership, unemployment, and, <clears throat> and incarceration. I'm going to say that again. I'm looking right at it. 50 years after the historic Kerner Commission report. That was a report that was made 50 years ago. Yes. It identified white racism as the key cause of pervasive discrimination in employment, education, and housing. And then it continues saying, there has been no progress. Didn't say some or maybe. There has been no progress in how African Americans fare in comparison to whites when it comes to home ownership, unemployment, and incarceration. Now, this is not Neely Fuller talking. This is a report that came out yesterday in a leading newspaper. You know, a very, you know, what you might call uh, reliable is supposed to be information mm -hmm. from the Washington Post newspaper. In some cases, African Americans are worse off than they were before the civil rights movement culminated in laws barring housing and voter discrimination as well as racial segregation. Worse off. Here it is, what, 2018? Yeah. 50 yes. years later? You're worse off than you were 50 years ago? Mm, mm, now, mm. This, this is an official report. It's not coming from me. Now, uh, you know, worse off. And it came from, in case you want to get to the source of where the Washington Post got their source, it says it came from the Economic Policy Institute. That was released on Monday. Mm -hmm. Now, was you that can probably you can top, probably do some research about yes the economic economic policy institute yes and how to get in touch with them to get that document yes to get the whole document that reports this. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't I don't know. It doesn't say here. 
yeah. how you get in contact with them. But I'm sure if you put it in, you can probably find out. Okay. Econo- the Economic Policy Institute. Uh, uh, President Johnson uh, asked for that report to be made. He said he wanted to find out why what was behind the riots. Because okay. there was a lot of talk that uh, the communists were behind the riots of 1968 that right after Martin Luther King was assassinated and all other riots that came before then and there were riots everywhere in the 1960s uh, black people in the streets so he said he wanted to find out exactly what all that was about whether the communists were behind it or who, who, whomever was, was causing all these riots in all the cities uh, black people out in the street rioting all the time, burning, looting. And uh, he said he believed that it might be the communists, but he wasn't sure. So he wanted an investigation, a thorough investigation to find out the cause of the riots. Mm-hmm. And he, uh, if I remember correctly, it was a governor called Otto Kerner. That governor, the task of finding out what's the cause of the riots. Months later, they came up with a report on the calls. Okay. Yeah. And they had a summary of that report. And in two words, they said, it's real simple. White racism. And they say, it says here something about incarceration. Let me see okay. if I marked it off here. Uh, say the share of incarceration, meaning black people in jail, has tripled between 1968 and 2016, especially for black men. And then in another part of this article, it says mass incarceration, meaning black people in jail, has become a kind of housing policy Wow. for the poor. Wow. All right. It didn't say specifically black people, but that's mostly black people who are filling up the jail. Mm. So they say, hey, if you start talking about black people being housed and whether or not black people's housing situation has improved since 1968, yes, if you're talking about if they're housed in jail, it has improved. So there's more black people in jail than there was then. Nearly full of junior, straight no chaser, ball, ball, tangibles 2020, logic, logic, reparations 2020. Logic, 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 and I hope I have contributed to less confusion. And always remember, keep learning, learning, and stay codified. Economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war. If you do not understand racism which is white supremacy, what it is and how it works. Everything else that you understand will only confuse you. Confuse you. Confuse you. Confuse you. Confuse you. If you do not understand, confuse you. If you do not understand, confuse you. If you do not understand, confuse you. Confuse you. My definition of white supremacy and racism, uh, I use those two terms as synonyms. I use the same definition for both terms. That definition is as follows. A global system of people who classify themselves as white and are dedicated to abusing and or subjugating everyone in the known universe whom they classify as not white. Economics, economics education, education, entertainment, entertainment labor, 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 law, politics, 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 politics religion, 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 sex, and war.